you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Take, if you will, a journey with me. Now, I'm Sherry and I'm the kids pastor, and so if this was a room full of kids, we would pretend to put on our hiking boots, so if you'd like to do that, you can go ahead, you might pull on your jacket or spray the off on you, whatever it might be, in order to go on a journey with me, but we're going to go back in time, back to a time of hope, back to a time of naivete, back to a time now, please don't laugh. Back to a time when we truly believed that the summer of 2020 would be just as wonderful and normal as every other summer has been on record. Please go with me back not that long ago, although it seems like it's been decades ago, three and a half months, April 19th, the Sunday after Easter. And on that day, we began our sermon series through the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. Since that time, our entire world has changed. Lives have been upended. Jobs have been lost, while others have worked longer hours than they ever have. Parents have become teachers. Teachers have become innovators. Some have gone hungry, while others have creatively sacrificed in order to feed the world around them. Isolation and loneliness have become the norm, while online interaction has gone through the roof. Lives have been lost. Yet souls have been saved. And incredibly, through this journey that we have all been on, God's word has kept up with everything. These ancient words have become fresh. They've become new, and they have been found relevant to every experience that we have every day. Don't we serve an amazing, all-knowing, everlasting God? Amen. Please, please go to him with me. Dear Heavenly Father, and we do not take those words lightly, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your very presence in this room. Thank you for being connected even to those who are, are watching from afar, whether right now or sometime in the future. Thank you for being like a father kneeling down to look into the eyes of his child and listen. And all God's children said, amen. So early on in our study in the Sermon on the Mount, our eyes were open to the fact that Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but instead to fulfill it, to change our focus from the letter of the law instead to the heart of God behind the law. And through that lens, Jesus has spoken to us about many things, uh, murder, adultery, divorce, oaths, revenge, love for our enemy, benevolence, prayer, fasting, treasure, worry, and judgment. And it is through this same lens, this same desire to open our eyes that Jesus speaks frankly to us about his love for his children. And so our goal today is to move our focus of prayer from a checklist 
of needs that we bring before our Father, but instead that prayer is a pathway into the very presence of God where all our needs are met and where fears are gone. So um, I'm going to ask you if you would, please turn in your Bible, whether it's a physical Bible, whether it's your phone app, or whether you'd like to follow along on the screen. But I'm going to ask that we all stand, whether here or at home, and read this scripture together with me. So would you please stand as we read this? Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for a bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Thank you. You may be seated. So to put ourselves in the shoes of the people who surrounded Jesus that day, who heard these words directly from his lips, let's take another journey. And for this journey, we're going to go back much, much farther. We're going to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve lived in paradise. There was abundant food amidst wild animals, and they were able to walk in the garden alongside their heavenly father, their creator, uninhibited, unafraid. That is, until sin entered and all of life changed. They and we, as a result, would live the rest of our lives separated from God, weighed down with pain and hurt, hard work, and especially sin. And for generations to come, God would choose to speak directly to only a few. And through that was brought about the sacrificial system, the building of the tabernacle, and then later the temple, all in which God's plan of reconciliation with his people was revealed. But then God went silent for four hundred years. And I can only imagine that those people surrounding Jesus on that day felt that God seemed far, far away. So let's take a closer look at the tabernacle and the ability to move into the presence of God. So the tabernacle, of course, was a portable house of worship that was built during the time of the Israelites wandering for 40 years after they had been released as slaves from Egypt. And then King Solomon later built a permanent structure called the temple to the same end. And in both, there were three distinct areas. First, there was the outer court out here. And then within the tent itself, First, there was the holy place, and in the very back was the holy of holies. And in the holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant was kept, which within it were the tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments on it. And it was in that place, in the holy of holies, where the Spirit of God dwelt. Only one day a year was anyone allowed into the Holy of Holies? And even then, it was the high priest who went through a series of cleansing and wearing just the right garb in order to go and put a sacrifice on the Ark of the Covenant and to hear from God. Anyone who dared to change that up in any way didn't get very far. They... they were killed immediately. The outer court was a very busy, noisy place, and that was as far as anybody like you and I could have made. The, the average 
Israelite could have only gone that far. And in the holy place, that was only for the priests. And again, they, they had to follow cleansing and wear the right garments and so forth before they were allowed in there. But even though that the Psalms speak of a loving God who would bring peace to his children and abundant blessings, many Jews had gotten caught up in the letter of the law. There were so many things that had been written. It was difficult, if not impossible, to follow. So I can only imagine that for some Jews, it was a blessing that all they had to do was come into the court, do what they had to do, and leave. Just everything else the professionals could do. A personal relationship with God would be far down on their list of desires. And when Jesus earlier in the sermon had told them to refer to God as their heavenly father, I'm sure the idea of a loving, generous, forgiving God was easily dismissed by, by many. It wasn't until I was an adult, having grown up in the church, wasn't until I was an adult and one evening was in a ladies Bible study that it dawned on me the term Heavenly Father could mean different things to different people. You see, I grew up in a Christian home. My dad is a preacher still in his 80s. Um, his parents were missionaries. My dad is not perfect, but he's pretty close. And because... <clears throat> Because of that, I never had to doubt God's love for me. I didn't doubt God's desire for my best. I didn't doubt his forgiveness. But on that night, in that room, were two sisters whose experience had been very, very different. The idea of a loving father who wanted his best for them was nothing that they could even remotely connect with, could not accept that there was a heavenly father who desired to pour out his blessings. And I can only imagine that the Jews at Jesus' time, after 400 years of silence, that maybe many of them felt the same, that God seemed too far away to care. So I need to ask you, are you in the same boat? I need you to, to consider your thoughts about God. Would you say he's gentle or harsh? Attentive or dismissive? Generous or stingy? Happy or angry? There are so many other questions that could be asked, but it is of dire importance that your perspective of God, our Heavenly Father, be shaped by His Word and not your personal experience. But with that in mind, let's continue. And the scripture says, ask and it will be given to you. And a little bit further, for everyone who asks, receives. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Very direct, very uncomplicated. Could even be explained in pictures. I want you to think of some object that you've bought and on the box it says assembly required. And you've reached in the box and you've pulled out the directions and you open them up and there are no words. There's just pictures. But somehow you understand. Maybe these words ask and it will be given to you could be explained in pictures as well. Someone asking a question, someone giving them a gift. There we go, simple as that. Similar to their experience in the outer court. Uncomplicated, bring sacrifice, priest burn it, we're okay. That's it, that's all that they needed to know. And so with this scripture, ask and it will be given to you. So all I have to do is open my mouth and God's going to respond? 
how exciting. Let me start out my wish list. Well, yes and no. Because the next verses remind us that even as sinful human parents, we love to give good gifts to our children. And so God, our Heavenly Father, wants that much more to do so much more for us. But as parents, we know that sometimes the best answer we can give is no, isn't it? For a child's own good. Many years ago, I knew a little boy who was about four years old, and everywhere he went, he carried his little sippy cup full of juice. He loved his juice, he, and, and he had the juice of the day, whatever it might be, in his cup. He carried it around with him always. And he was always drinking his juice, and his parents thought, hey, this is great because this is healthier than Kool-Aid or whatever it might be, so we're good. Unfortunately, they did not realize that that amount of juice on his teeth day after day began eroding them away. And before this little boy even entered kindergarten, before his adult teeth came in, he had to have extensive tooth work done. A lesson, unfortunately, they learned the hard way. Would they have been, would he have been much better off had they said no to all the juice? Here's some water. Absolutely. But they made a mistake and they paid for it. Praise God, unlike human parents who make mistakes, God never makes mistakes. And in his wisdom, he knows better what we need and he would never give us anything that is hurtful. But then you might ask, well, if he is so wise, why do we even need to ask? Why doesn't God just give us what we need? James chapter 4 verse 2 says this, you do not have because you do not ask God. So just as the outer court and bringing a sacrifice was the beginning of the journey to the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, Asking for our needs to be met is just the beginning of the journey for us to go into the presence of God. Hopefully, just asking is not where your journey ends. There is so much more to be gained as we are drawn closer to God. So let's see what's next. Seek and you will find. The one who seeks finds. So I have a question for you. Let me see hands. How many of you like word games? Anybody? My, my son would be going, nerd, you know, as soon as I said that. But I do. I love word games. If one of these days, I've got to get on Wheel of Fortune, but, you know, we'll see. But I recently discovered Scrabble online, and I am hooked. Luckily, I realized that with online Scrabble, they don't expect you to sit and play the whole game in one setting. Um, I, I, I spent some long hours waiting for the person to do the next turn <laughs> before I realized that. But so now I have several games going at any, at any given time. And when I have a few minutes in the middle of the day, I can hop on and, and do a turn and then go on about my business. Well, recently I played a game and in my, in my tiles, I got the word or the letters for the word Jaguar. And I got, I got really excited. Because I thought, wow, what a cool word. Who would, who would get all those letters? And the letter J has eight points to it. So you put that in just the right spot on the bonus square, you're going to end up getting lots and lots of points. So I was really excited. So I was focused, and I was going to save that word so I could, I, could, I could get in the Hall of Fame for Scrabble Online. So the first, the first turn, I just played the letter I because there was nowhere for me to put Jaguar. And then, and so I just made a few points. And then the next turn came and I just used whatever the extra letter was. And I think I did that for two or three more turns, sacrificing some good words that I could have done, some, sacrificing some good points. But I was convinced Jaguar was going to have me win this game. And finally... Finally, the spot opened up. There was an opportunity to use the word jaguar. 
but there were no bonus spots, bonus spaces anywhere in that word. So yeah, I got to play that cool word and I got to get, you know, a certain number of points, but it wasn't what I had expected. My, my hopes had been dashed. Have you ever been disappointed after you have put so much work or effort into something and it not turn out the way that you would hope? In the holy place, there were, there were three items. There was the golden lampstand, lamp um, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. Only priests were allowed to go in there, and again, only after they had had ceremonial cleansing and they were wearing the white garments. There was no walking in after a hard day and your street clothes going in to do what and had to be done. And these items symbolized God as the light to the world, symbolized God's presence in the world, and symbolized God's listening ear to the prayers of his people. Symbols, but not God himself. But there was work to be done, rituals to be, to be done each day and each week. And as we seek in our prayers, there is some work to be done, isn't there? We, we actively look for an answer that only God can provide. Sometimes we stumble in the process. Doubt gets in our way. Selfishness, unrepented sin, or a focus on something that we are so certain is God's will that our eyes are closed to the other opportunities around us. These things can stand in the way of God's best for us. Much like the word jaguar, our focus on one thing and one thing only can get in the way of true progress and ultimate failure. These obstacles can only be removed when God's light shines on them and we're willing to release them to God. Remember that perspective of God as a heavenly father. Are there things that we have believed of him because of our negative earthly experience with fathers that are standing in your way of coming into God's presence? And if that is so, search God's word. Seek what he has to say about himself. Seek wisdom from godly friends. Be honest and be repentant of what stands in your way, what's holding you back. And then next we're told to knock. Knock and the door will be open to you and to the one who knocks, the door will, will be opened. So I have a question for you. Have you ever been woken up in the middle of the night to this? I don't know if that was very loud or not. A pounding on the door. That can be very unsettling, can't it? And it happens when there is a need that cannot wait until morning or as an alarm to danger that is surrounding us. And when that happens, we move quickly and forcefully to do whatever it takes to bring our family and our loved ones to safety. Think of the Day of Atonement as that knock, that pound on the door to remind God's people of the dangers around them. The biggest danger of all was the consequence of their sin, the consequence of our sin, separation from God. And so on the Day of Atonement, the high priest entering the Holy of Holies would bring the blood and place it on the altar. And I'm told that the, the smoke of the incense 
from the altar of incense would, would be before him to keep him safe from what? From God's presence. And again, if that priest did not respond in the correct way, the sins of the people would not be rolled back. It would be on them. How do we respond to danger? Knocking represents coming to God our Father, knowing that He alone has the answer. He alone can take away our fear. Knocking is focused, it is persistent, and it is confident. We know that there is a definite need to come into his presence and full acceptance that only God can meet our needs. Just recently, I awoke in the middle of the night to not a pound on the door, but to my two-year-old grandson just wailing, just wailing. And I went in his room and I, I tried to pat his back and I tried to say kind words and, any, and nothing Nothing I could do or say worked until I reached down and I picked him up and he curled up in his arms and he laid his head on my chest. And at that moment, whatever had scared him, whatever fear there had been, whatever need he had was met in my arms. The wailing stopped, his breathing slowed, and he was able to fall peacefully into a deep sleep. Everything that he needed was found that moment in my arms. Now throughout our study on the Sermon on the Mount, we have purposed to draw attention away from the letter of the law to the heart of God. Just imagine those people surrounding Jesus that day, hearing these words from his mouth. Little did they know that in the not far future, they would be witnesses to the destruction of those very barriers that had kept them away from God's presence for so long. In Matthew 27, we find Jesus on the cross. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple, the barrier between the holy place and the holy of holies, was torn in, in two from top to bottom by God's very own hand. He tore it away. At that moment, he said, my children, I want to be in your presence. Come to me. There is no more barrier. Psalm 17 says it beautifully. I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. Show me the wonders of your great love, you who save by your right hand those who take refuge in you from their foes. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who are out to destroy me, from my mortal enemies who surround me. The purpose of prayer in our lives is not to have a checklist and make sure our needs get met. But instead, it is a privilege. It is a journey toward the very heart of God to be in his presence. Through this journey, our needs are met. Peace is found. Direction for our day is given and a light is given to our path. And it is only through that journey into the presence of God that we can meet the challenge that Jesus has for us next. 
So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. I have to admit, when I was given this scripture for this week to talk about prayer, I got rather nervous. There are much stronger prayer warriors than I will ever be. There are thousands and thousands of books and sermons and devotions and just so much that has been written about prayer. What in the world could God speak through me? And, and I began, began searching. What will be the end of this sermon? What will be that shining moment that everyone will go and remember? And after doing that for a few days, I realized... Jaguar. I was focusing on something that is not God's best. And it's not how he would have us finish this today. Because we can talk about prayer all day long. But until we go to the throne room ourselves, we've missed out. There's a story that I believe was first printed in a book back in the 1920s, about 100 years ago, and I've seen it uh, in many different iterations and in many different places. But it, it tells about a pastor who visited a terminally ill man. And he went to visit this man in his home and, of course, in his bedroom. And when the pastor got in the room, he saw that there was a chair an empty chair right next to the man's bed. And, and so he made a comment, oh, you knew I was coming. Thank you for having that chair for me. And, and the man said, no, no. That chair is where my Lord sits. You see, for years, for most of my life, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know where or how. I just, so I gave up. I didn't do it. Until a few years ago, a friend gave me the best piece of advice I've ever received. And he said, prayer is just a conversation with your Lord Jesus Christ. So do this. When you're ready to pray, bring an empty chair in front of you. And imagine that your Lord Jesus Christ is sitting right there and speak to him. Have a conversation. And the man who was sick said, my entire life changed. I went from not being able to pray for more than 10 seconds to spending hours in prayer. Well, the pastor stayed for a little bit longer and, and took his leave. And within just a few days, he heard that the man had passed away. And so the pastor went and visited the, the man's daughter and to offer his condolences. And she said, you know, it was the strangest thing. You know, he's been sick in bed for so long. Yet, before he passed, he had pulled that chair right up next to him and laid his head in the chair and that's where he died so this is what I am inviting you to do here in this room at home find an empty chair and I encourage you if you would like to here in this room you don't have to imagine there are plenty of empty chairs you can move to one but if not Please imagine Jesus in the chair right in front of you. And instead of me trying to come up with some fantastic words to say, we're just going to spend some time in God's presence. So whether you physically do it or you, you imagine it, I'm going to ask you to look at Jesus in that chair. And I'm going to read to you some words him speaking directly to you. And you might recognize this little book. Pastor Carl uses it quite often. This is a, a dear devotional that he was given many years ago called Streams in the Desert. And he has allowed me to use it this morning. 
But as you picture Jesus sitting there in front of you, I want you to listen closely to these words he has for you. And I will let you know that after I've read these words, we're going to have some silence and that's okay. Because there may be some other things that he has to speak to you or maybe there are things that you need to speak to him. We don't want anything to get in the way of being in the presence of God. So listen to these words. My child, I still have windows in heaven. They are yet in service. The bolts slide as easily as of old. The hinges have not grown rusty. I would rather fling them open and pour forth than keep them shut and hold back. I opened them for Moses and the sea parted. I opened them for Joshua and Jordan rolled back. I opened them for Gideon and hosts fled. I will open them for you if you will only let me. On this side of the windows, heaven is the same rich storehouse as of old. The fountains and streams still overflow. The treasure rooms are bursting with gifts. The lack is not on my side. It is on yours. I am waiting. Prove me now. Fulfill the conditions on your part. Bring in the tithes. Give me a chance. If Jesus Christ truly is your Savior and Lord, I pray that you have been drawn fully into his presence today. That your needs have been met and your fears are gone. But if Jesus is not your Savior and not your Lord, this may all feel like foolishness. Or it may have caused you to ask many more questions. And if that is the case, please, please come. There are many of us who would love to walk through the journey to God together with you. Dear Heavenly Father, and you truly are our Father filled with goodness with abundance and with every good gift able to meet every need and able to comfort and wipe all fear away. We thank you. We crawl up into your lap and lay our heads on your chest and we rest. In your precious name.